So I first started uh, using geodetic techniques, mainly GPS, when I was working uh, as a volcanologist as during my master's degree in terms of just positioning our observations and our, our samples on the ground. And that led to actually using real-time kinematic GPS, where we integrated RTK with uh, magnetometers. And that was to basically do really high-resolution mapping of the Earth's magnetic field that we used to map buried lava flows and volcanoes. And the cool part of that was for, for really trying to understand volcanic risk at uh, nuclear facilities. And from that, I actually developed what we called the mountain bike magnetometer. So we could actually track the position of where we were mountain biking with a magnetometer on board that was telemetered back to a vehicle where someone was watching the Earth's magnetic field in real time with the positioning. So they could actually tell us where to bike or where to walk. And after that, that transitioned into actually getting into tectonic geodesy using the global positioning system and, and working with my, who would then be my future advisor, Tim Dixon, who was at Miami, uh, we started working with him on some projects related to Yucca Mountain. And so um, it's really GPS as a technology has been integrated into my research at, at all those different, different levels. Now I mainly use it for volcanic and tectonic geodetic problems for understanding uh, magmatic tectonic processes. What do I call myself? It's, it's always interesting when we have people come and visit our department and you know they come and visit each of the faculty and they say, well, what, what do you call yourself? And I guess it depends on the day. If I'm working on one of our vol volcanism projects, I'll call myself a volcanologist or volcano geodesist. When I'm working on my plate boundary zone deformation work, I call myself a tectonic geodesist or geophysicist. So I think it, it depends, but I'm not a true geodesist. Um, I'm really a geoscientist, uh, geophysicist who use, uses geodetic methods um, to really understand Earth processes. So I first started doing um, tectonic geodesy back in 1998. We did our, what would be my first campaign in the Eastern California shear zone. And uh, that was just really cool to me to be able to um, you know, do all the episodic measurements um, and at the same time get, a, get, get the ability to look at the geology on the ground as well and see how our measurements were going to help us understand, in that case, the um, strain accumulation in the Eastern California shear zone. So, so we use um, GPS geodesy in my lab to understand magmatic processes. How does magma move or migrate? Where is it stored in, in the Earth's crust? And what happens as it migrates to the surface before uh, volcanoes erupt? And then what happens to magmatic systems during and after eruptions? But we also use um, GPS geodesy to look at tectonic processes. For example, the earthquake cycle. Where and how, um, what's the magnitude of strain accumulation on, on plate boundaries? How does that relate to earthquake hazards? And more recently, um, because of our work in Iceland, we've really had to delve into cryospheric science because of um, a, very, a large increase in mass loss uh, of the Icelandic ice caps. So now we're looking at solid earth processes related to the cryosphere. I would say, I think one of the coolest things that we've learned about the earthquake cycle is that we didn't know so much about the earthquake cycle. And what I mean by that is with the expansion of GPS networks that UNAVCO has been really fun, played a fundamental role in doing, um, beginning with Panga and, and, and other networks in the Pacific Northwest, we've learned this whole other part of the, the earthquake cycle spectrum in terms of slow slip or episodic slow slip uh, events along major plate boundary thrust systems. And I think that's really changed our way of looking at these major thrust systems. What's the behavior of these um, before, during, and after earthquakes? So I think really if, if you want to put it into uh, perspective of networks and the installation of networks, whether it's PBO or smaller networks like Panga or now CocoNet, the expansion of the, these networks and our ability to really look at the whole Earth system 
uh, I think is really exciting in terms of things that UNAVCO has helped advance and the, com the community. I would say um, our ability to, to install these networks, um, obviously the, the, one of the, the driving factors was cost early on, but now our ability to actually install sites in the most un, uh, inhospitable places, you know, from the East African Rift to Greenland or Antarctica and, and keep these sites running year in, year out, and our ability to return that data at, at very high rates, I think is, is also helping. So having real-time high-rate networks is going to prove very crucial moving forward, especially in terms of making our science relative to, to societal issues like hazards and, and uh, those sorts of things. Uh, well, the first thing is, is moving from things like the TI-4100 to being able to, you know, basically put a small kit together and go anywhere in the world and start making geodetic measurements almost right out of, right out of the box and, and being able to expand across plate boundary zones and, and not only measure um, tectonic effects, but all the cool uh, things that the community is doing in terms of looking at atmospheric processes and um, hydrologic processes, cryospheric processes. I think over just the last decade, the expansion of GPS geodesy across the whole Earth science spectrum is really exciting and, and I think that's going to take us to all new places in, in, in the coming decades. I think the future holds um, really having uh, these hemisphere-wide networks. And the larger the networks we have, the more ability we have to look at the interface between the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, atmosphere, and solid Earth processes. And I think the exciting thing is combining all these um, in some way that we can improve our understanding of, of climate change, climate risk, um, and, and earth, uh, earthquake hazards, natural hazards, I should say, and the risks associated with those. I really see us moving more from the science into societal issues and, and being able to improve our hazard, hazard and risk assessments. Go UNAVCO. <laughs>